Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the Alliance Against Exclusion and Restraint podcast and live series. My name is Guy Stevens. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. I started the Alliance a little over two years ago and uh, started to raise awareness about the issue of restraint and seclusion in schools across the nation. Our, our mission continues to, to expand and, and we're not only concerned about restraint and seclusion, but ex, uh, expulsion, suspension, corporal punishment, all the things that are being done to kids rather than working with them. And our uh, mission is really to educate the public and bring people together to change hearts, minds, policies, policies and practices so we can do better. Uh, you know, we absolutely believe we can do better. And if we can do better, we have an obligation to do better. We want to ultimately see safer schools for students, teachers and staff. We're very excited today to have an amazing guest with us, Greg Santusi, who will be joining us for a kind of a hybrid of a little bit of presentation, a little bit of interview, a lot of discussion. Uh, we're going to be taking your questions uh, during the presentation and after the presentation today as well. So feel free to post those in the chat uh, or as we kind of get to a point, uh, ask questions as you have them. The event today is as always being recorded and we will make that available on YouTube and Facebook after the fact. As well, we offer it as an audio podcast. So you'll be able to uh, download and listen to that as well. So with that, uh, let me introduce, I'm very excited here to introduce my co-host to you today. Uh, my co-host today is the amazing Beth Tolley. And Beth is the Director of Educational Policy here at the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, Beth, and in fact, I just realized that I, that I didn't have my notes up here on Beth, so I've, I've got to totally ad lib this, but I, I think I can do it by now, Beth. I think I know you well enough. Uh, let's see. Several years ago, you, re you retired from your your position at a uh, Virginia's lead agency for for uh, let's see infants and toddlers, and uh, you know since you retired, you continue to do a lot of amazing work, and we were lucky enough to connect. Gee, uh, about two years ago and uh, have been working together here at the Alliance since then. Uh, you're an amazing advocate for for kids and for families and, uh, you know, really appreciate you being part of the program today, Beth. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you if you would to uh, let's go ahead and bring Greg up and if you would be so kind to introduce him. Sure. I can't remember if he said I was a pediatric PT when I started my career career. So I'll just throw that in. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Greg, who is uh, an occupational therapist and the founding director of Power Play Pediatric Therapy. He's been an OT for over 20 years and is currently the supervisor of the uh, OT at Children's Specialized Hospital in New Jersey. He's been lecturing, lecturing nationally for over a decade on topics related to sensory processing, challenging behaviors, and best practice in public schools. He's the father of two kids and he's married to an OT that I didn't know that part. Um, so he shares his toys with all three of them. Yes, I married up. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> Greg, we're, we're, we're so excited to have you here today. And, uh, you know, I know that, that we have probably a lot of people in, in our community here at the Alliance and, and, you know, the community of people that, that are following your work um, that probably probably share a lot of people in common, right. uh, a lot of people that are interested in, in doing things, you know, better for kids, better for families. Um, your work has been really, really inspiring. Uh, you know, you, you've had a couple of uh, infographics you've created recently that have just exploded on the internet and, and people have been uh, talking about, and we're really excited to have you here. Uh, I know that you had uh, a few uh, slides that we were gonna talk about and uh, share a little bit of your story as well. And I'll go ahead and bring your, your slide deck up here, but I'd welcome you to kind of share a little bit of, of this and, and then we'll get into having some conversation and asking a lot of questions. And I will let you know, you, you're popular enough that the spammers are apparently out. So I'll take care of that while you uh, and, <laughs> get started here. And I, I am extraordinarily proud of, um, when I do live sessions, the, the, the community that, that we've created and that I hope that they're here and that they ask questions and share comments, I am going to give a little background information um, to try to get everybody on the same page regarding sensory processing. Um, but the fun of this is the dialogue. Um, so thank you for having me today. It's great to be here amongst friends um, and, and preaching as to how we can do better for our kids. Um, so I, as you said, I am an occupational therapist. Um, I have a master's degree in OT. I have a certification in sensory integration, but my real education has come from the kids that I've worked with. Um, so as a newer clinician, I thought that I had all the answers. And then I learned that a lot of times the kids have the answers. 
So we just have to be really good at actually listening, listening to them and not just grabbing power any chance we get and uh, doing a little bit of detective work and great things happen. So some key points about today that I kind of want to lay the foundation for. Um, first, the, the buzzword sensory. So every bit of information that we get from this world comes in through our senses. We see things, hear things, touch, smell, taste things, we move, and or a combination thereof, and that's how we get information and then function from there. All of us experience the world differently, and that's okay. So we'll say it with learning styles, like, oh, he's a visual learner, or, or she's a kinesthetic learner. Um, but for neurodivergent kids, it, it isn't just about learning. It's really a lot about survival as well. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, the different senses and, um, and elaborate on that. So the other point that I want to make, and I put in uh, this slide talking about, of course, now you're not going to change on me. It froze up on me. Oh, wait, it's trying. So I'll keep going. The slide will catch up. Um, <laughs> the uh, we, we, we can't impose our own sensory preferences on another person. Um, so if I think food, a certain food is spicy, it's spicy. There we go. The slide, oops, the slide just caught up and then it disappeared. Bear That's with me one second. <laughs> While you're doing that, hey, uh, Guy, could you pop up uh, Jenna White's comment? It was up earlier in the thing. Uh, yeah, let me take a look. I'm, I'm trying to stop the uh, the mass spammer who's spamming our yeah. feed oh, here. Okay. Um, and, and I'm not seeing Jenna's comment here. Um, well, uh, I'll just tell you what she said. She said sure. she loved, loved, loved OT. It saved your son's life. Ah, oh, fantastic. And, and PowerPoint was giving me a hard time, so I just stopped sharing the screen, and here we are, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> the, um, we can't impose our own sensory preferences on another person, um, as I was saying. Um, so if a child tells me that genes are crunchy, genes are crunchy. Not that, oh, you're fine and, and you'll be okay. No, genes are actually crunchy, and food may be spicy. Um, or you can't deny that they're experiencing something a certain way. That sensory invalidation, sensory invalidation was a term that I actually learned from my colleague, Kieran Rose, the autistic advocate. Um, and he talks about that and how it can promote autistic masking and how it really can be a big trust breaker in the relationship that's so important to, to help kids um, move forward and, and learn in school. So those were kind of the, the key points that I wanted to lay out. I did want to, to start um, by referencing the article that you had so graciously published in December um, about my experience in the seclusion room. Um, and ironically, reading through the literature about seclusion rooms, and they get really cute with their names. Um, they'll call it uh, the cool down room, the quiet room, the blue room, the reflection room. And what's most offensive for me is that they'll call it the sensory room. It is not a sensory room. It is a sensory deprivation room. Um, that if there is a sensory room, it was probably built by an OT and it's gorgeous and very calming and relaxing and wonderful. Um, the seclusion room that I was exposed to was old wrestling mats on the floor and on the walls. And when I saw it, um, it really, took me back when I, when you saw it, it's, it's an intimidating space. And so I decided to sit in it and just experience the, what it's like to be in there from a kid's perspective. So we talk about it all the time. I went right in there. Uh, the room was built, it had a clipboard outside uh, to keep track of why the kid was there and, and how long they were there. And it was intended to only be used in extreme circumstances. Um, but it's like a field of dreams thing. Like if you build it, they will come. If you build the seclusion room, this is like a field of nightmares. The mm -hmm. If you build it, they're going to use it. The teachers are going to use it. And that's what was happening um, for defiance, disruptions, whatever they wanted. Um, and 
the kids that we're putting in the seclusion room, the vast majority of whom have special needs, as you well know, um, we're certainly not listening to them or, or empathizing with them or validating them. Um, and if you've ever seen somebody being put in a seclusion room, it's not like they're holding hands and skipping along the way. It's, it's not, not the nicest of sights. Um, so getting back to sensory, sensory is, is a buzzword. And we've gotten to the point in schools where they think everything is sensory. Oh, look at that presentation just showed up again. Fantastic. Thank you, guy. Poo. <laughs> um, so okay, there's a quick definition of sensory processing. It is a natural process of brain functioning. It is happening all of the time. You take information in, you interpret it, you process it, and that allows us to understand the word. Um, but now in the schools, everything's sensory. He's picking his nose, it's sensory. He's sticking his hand on his pants, it's sensory. He's biting his nails, it's sensory. It's sensory. Call the OT. I need a weighted vest. I need a sensory diet pronto. That's kind of where the schools are right now. Um, so in order to, to validate the way kids process sensory input, um, we have to know a little bit about what the senses are. So that was the foundation that I wanted to lay today. Uh, when you walk into an elementary school, you see the um, they're teaching the five senses. And I love that. And, and a lot of school-based OTs try to jump right into those lessons um, and teach about the, the five senses. But for OTs, we like to talk about eight. So the five senses, you see things, you, you hear things, you touch, you taste, you smell. Those are the ones that we remember learning in school. Um, and I want to not necessarily define them, um, but I, I want to kind of bring to life what it looks like in school and where we have opportunities to validate how a kid is experiencing the world. So let's start with vision. So if a child, um, and the, the next slide guy has the, uh, the, the five senses that I'm talking about. Um, if the child has a visual deficit, and I believe it's one in six kids, one in six school age kids has an underlying visual deficit. Um, that's going to impact their ability to focus, pay attention, um, their behavior. And if we push them, and we're certainly guilting of pushing kids to their breaking points at time, that could escalate a situation. So a kid's looking at a worksheet, it's visually overwhelming for them, that's going to influence their behavior. Um, so again, that detective work, knowing trying to know as much as possible of what's going on. Why is it hard for them? You know, what's giving them the, the hard time? We have to know that. Autistic children are often visually defensive. So eye contact is very difficult for them, if not painful for them. Um, visual fixations, staying on something for a, a certain amount of time is difficult for them. So that we file that under the, the vision category of sensory processing. When we're talking about auditory, uh, your auditory sense, sounds can be very distracting or very dysregulating. So if a kid is sensitive to sound and there's not tennis balls on the bottom of the chairs in school and you push that chair back, that could be alerting to them and dysregulating for them. Or somebody tapping their foot or the the paraprofessional's voice sitting next to them could just be too much. So you have to look for those signs of stress. And a lot of times you can see it in their posture. You can see it in their face. Um, and those signs of stress we have to pick up on because that's our best chance to avoid escalations and then avoid challenging behaviors and then avoid the seclusion room. So we have to be sensitive to how these kids um, are sensing the world and we have to honor their sensory preferences. For touch um, or your tactile sense, um, there's there's a video in in um, Ross Green's documentary, the kids the kids we lose that 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 clip. You see a kid out at a the, either the water table or the sand table and he's flapping his arms and he's stressing out. And I'm sitting there going, that kid's probably tactile defensive. Um, there was a child that I was working with who um, had a really interesting situation where he was extremely tactile defensive and had probably the worst thing happen to him ever. He was uh, about a first grader, six or seven year old. Um, a girl in his class came up and gave him a big giant hug. 
Ew. Um, so he is super tactile defensive. And this girl just came up and hugged him. So in addition to dealing with the cooties that he just had from the girl hugging him, um, his skin was just completely crawling. Um, and you know, he had challenging behaviors and he had some, some anger issues. Um, and there was a substitute teacher that day. So the teacher didn't know, the substitute didn't know about his significant tactile defensiveness. And I was super proud of this guy because after the hug, he, instead of hitting her, which would have been his typical response, he actually went and he hid under the teacher's desk. And I'm like, that's a win. Like he got away from the noxious tactile experience. And this, this stalker of a first grader, um, she followed him under the desk and he, <laughs> he took a paper clip and he said, leave me alone. I'm going to shoot you, choo, 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 and got suspended. Um, because <laughs> I know, right? The um, you know the the girl's parents called the school and felt that the classroom wasn't safe for her, and it was all it started because of the tactile defensiveness. And he needed that adult support. They had a window of opportunity when he went under the desk. He was unlucky in the sense that it was a substitute teacher, but it all started from him being significantly tactile defensive and having to to deal with the big hug. Um, okay, so we did vision, auditory, touch, taste, and smell. So I have uh, been in some classrooms and some lunchrooms that have some pretty unique smells to them. And uh, smells can be overwhelming for kids. Maybe it's your perfume or your cologne. Maybe it's the cleaner that they're using in school that is, is setting you off. Um, for, for parents, maybe your child has decided that they're not eating dinner tonight while you're still preparing it because they can smell it and want nothing to do with it. So all of these sensory processing issues are, these are the real life things that happen. So those are the five senses. Those are the ones that we're learning about in school. But OTs have to level that up and we have to talk about three additional senses which are so important. And the more we can learn about these and teach kids about their bodies and what they're feeling, um, the better we can collaborate them to solve problems, to avoid escalation, to avoid the punishments and, and everything that we have. So the first big word, um, and, and Guy, you can switch the slide to the next three because these are, these are great spelling words. Um, vestibular, that's a nice fancy word. That's, that is a fancy word for movement. It's movement, your balance sense, your sense of gravity. Um, your vestibular system touches every part of the brain. And there are clear links to um, movement and academic performance. Um, movement can be very calming for people and it can be very alerting for people. You can use it in two different ways. Um, I actually ran a pilot study in a school district that I was in where we had done movement breaks, a, a program called Brain Breaks two to five minute activity breaks, um, where if the kids were getting antsy, uh, the teacher wouldn't move their clip or yell at them or tell them to sit still. The teacher would have the whole classroom stand up as a community and get up and move a little bit. Um, the, the pilot study had 5,000 kids. They had access to these brain breaks and the teachers loved it so much that they logged 40,000 minutes of brain breaks in the first year. The results were that behavioral referrals went down and math scores in the district ticked up just from movement. And the following year, they logged another 32,000 minutes. So, you know, if a kid is, is feeling antsy and needs to move, get them up and move. It. Don't get mad at them for not sitting perfectly still. That's not how they learn. Um, you know, if, you, if your kids are, are a little bit sluggish, get them up and move it. Or if you just need to take a break from learning, get them up and moving. That vestibular sense is so powerful. And there's plenty of literature across disciplines showing just how effective it is as not only improving behaviors, but improving academic performance. Ah, we love the vestibular sense, OTs. Yes, we do. Um, so proprioception is another fancy word. It's really fun if you roll the R and you say proprioception. Um, but that's that's body awareness. Essentially, that's what helps you walk through a door frame. 
uh, walk through a door without walking into the door frame, and we've all been there. Um, so the kids who are bumping into other kids in line, um, no, you don't have to take dojo points away from them for bumping into another kid. You have to respect their body awareness challenges. Um, they will also be running their hands along the wall, um, getting very close to those sacred bulletin boards that you can't, you know, you're not supposed to touch. Um, so, or they're falling out of their chair. Again, not a behavioral issue, a sensory issue. Um, or they're inadvertently knocking down that block tower that their friends just made on the rug and they didn't even realize that they walked into it. Um, that's body awareness. Those are your, your bulls in a china shop, your, your clumsy kids. Um, they need our support. They don't need to be blamed or shamed for being clumsy. They don't want to be clumsy. Uh, they have proprioception challenges, and we need to understand that while we're interacting them with, with them. Um, and the last one is interoception. And this is the one that's probably getting the most buzz in the literature. Um, there's a lot of research um, behind it now. Um, so it's kind of exploding. It's really exciting. And for lack of a better term, it really makes sense. Um, so interoception is what you're feeling on the inside. So as adults, we all know that we're not our best selves when we're hungry or when we're hangry or when we have a headache or if we have to go to the bathroom. So same thing for our kids. Interoception is what you're feeling on the inside and it tells you all about those things. Um, you can get a lot of information from kids, you know, interact with about how they're feeling, what's hard for them when they're, you're asking them to do a task or a demand in the classroom. And interesting, um, I just recently watched a YouTube video of a 12-year-old autistic girl, and she shared, shared something that I thought was really profound, that regarding interoception, that there's often a disconnect. And again, this, this, these were her words as a 12-year-old autistic girl, that autistic kids often don't know how they're feeling or the difference between body sensations and emotions. So she didn't know if she was feeling frustrated or feeling hungry. And I thought that was absolutely a fascinating real life experience from her. And it made me think, and I'm still kind of processing that, but interoception is a very real sense. And again, the more information we can get by partnering with our kids and relying on our relationship with them to learn about how they're processing the world, the better we'll be able to support them and the better they're going to be able to meet the expectations of school or of home. So, so go ahead. Okay. I have, uh, I've been holding my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, because as, as now. Gone, yeah, really. Um, as you've gone through it, several things have struck me. Um, okay. it, when I, when I really started diving deeply into this work, it was really clear how we as adults needed to be the ones that did work on, on, recognizing where we were in terms of self-regulation and and all of that stuff as you talk about the sensory stuff i thought as you were talking about sensory validation i thought about how so much of i remember trainings or vi videos where um a dad a kid falls down and uh hurts his knee and the dad is saying oh you're fine you're fine and and it's praised us you know, you've made this kid feel okay. He didn't have to feel bad. And that's the kind of training people that are my age got as being good. You're really supporting a, a child and being able to handle whatever comes their way. And so I recognize that a lot of what we learned was sensory invalidation. That's my first point. Um, the yeah. other point was that adults have got to understand like these last three, um, I'm terrible at all three of these. We have to understand, number one, we have to get them ourselves, uh, know where we are and what we need to do about it, but we also need to understand what they are for the rest of the world. And I love that that kids are, are being in, in classes like Lori DeSalti, DeSaltels. I always want to call you DeSaltes. I know Lori's on the line, but 
Dessel tells. Um, <laughs> she's teaching, uh, and the people, and you're teaching the people that are teaching kids to recognize what they're feeling and what what they're doing. I, it's wonderful. Um, so I think we have the the parents, the teachers. What kids are coming into an environment where the adults have not been prepared, and it's not their fault. Right. It just wasn't there. Right. It's interesting that that what you said, like we have to find it in ourselves. So there's a very popular program in in uh, the OT world called the Zones of Regulation, um, and and I think Mona Delahook and I agree on this that Zones of reg Regulation is great for the adults. Um, that knowing where we're at and, and what we need to, to, to get our emotional level and arousal level in, in a good place so that we can, you know, interact with these kids from a place of, of calm and, and regulation and starting there. So I, th I think a lot of our, our similar missions is, is learning about our own bodies and keeping our own selves in check um, as a starting point. And, and it's okay to call ourselves out. I've called myself out personally a lot, and I've taught myself to 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 check myself and come from a place of calm. Um, and boy, did the outcomes change when, when that mm -hmm. happened. So yes, we do have to recognize our own sensory processing issues. I mean, I myself, I'm I'm tactile defensive, and you know, I'm I'm working with kids who lick my head. Um, true story, <laughs> multiple times, and. and <laughs> <laughs> and here I am with with a wet head. I had um I had a little guy. Uh, it was during St. Patrick's Day. Those little window stickers. He took one off the window and he stuck it on the back of my neck. It's May. I still feel it. <laughs> so, so I, yeah. I, you know, you you do. You have to understand your own senses. And and as adults with frontal lobes, um, mm -hmm. we have to have strategies to, to come from a place of calm. So I, I appreciate those, those points. Yes. You got more? Should I, cause I've, I've got like That's it for now. Time. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm watching the comment section scroll and I'm getting really excited. So I, I just want to be like, Greg, shut up. Let's listen. Um, but we know, we know that neurodivergent kids have sensory processing challenges. Um, there is agreement in the literature on this um, and sensations that we neurotypical adults can take for granted can be extremely overwhelming for kids. Some examples, the ventilation system in a room. Um, I worked with a kid who would melt down before computer class every time they went to the specials for computer and it was because of the fans in the class in the the room all of those computer fans that we took for granted just blew his brain up mm. um you know kids running in the gym could be overwhelming for kids the cafeteria is a nightmare so, so it, go ahead how did you figure out the computer fan thing for the child it was a meeting with his family his his dad um we were talking about it and and the dad walked in and and we we knew some auditory sensitivities but the dad walked in and immediately knew just immediately and all poof, our brains just blew up like there it is so then it was a conversation with with him i, I believe headphones may have come Mm. as one of the solutions at the time that was several years ago. But yeah, the dad picked up on it right away. Yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah. Because that's what strikes me is that if we're not open to input from different people and we stay in that old mantra of what happened before, mm -hmm. you know, the immediate preceding event and, and all that kind of FBA, um, we miss the stuff. And the kids themselves and the family who know the kids are such great sources. I didn't know that's what you were going to say, but that's great. Yeah, uh, I, I'm staring at the comments from Jennifer um, about the zones of regulation. And I agree with something that she she said that you, the zones of regulation, kids are, are labeling their emotions. And sometimes we'll use the characters from inside out to kind of get there. But um, it's very difficult for kids to to label their emotions they may not know what frustrated or anxious is and and they may even be just telling us 
what we want to hear or or guessing but so for a mm -hmm. lot of kids they mm -hmm. don't know that um so it's it's a very good point um i happen to like energy levels um to talking about energy levels versus emotional states um and and our, our friends at autism level up have great literature about energy levels um but it sensory overload is very very real and it can very much impact school performance and it can absolutely shut a kid down um and in school we keep pushing we keep pushing mm -hmm. the academics we keep pushing getting mm -hmm. one more worksheet finish that worksheet um no recess until you finish that worksheet and we keep focusing on compliance and we're not very flexible with these kids and we're not validating their sensory preferences because we're not even inquiring um and then we push and then we escalate so the my last point is is a question to all of us is how often do we the adults contribute to the escalation that leads to a trip to the seclusion room i'm gonna say that it's probably more than we'd like to admit and we have to start owning that um and again this is just about understanding kids partnering with kids respecting them right. um and going from there so with that i'll exhale <laughs> yeah, and you, as you're telling that story about we push, we push, um, there was a, an example in Virginia where um, I became aware of a situation where a child, they knew he wore out around lunch and, and they kept saying, you got to finish this work page. Actually, it was one teacher said that he went to the next class, kid was six. And the next, and the, and the, the one where the class was said, you can do it at home why he even needed to do it, I'm not sure. But anyway, at the next class, a special ed teacher says, you need to finish it. You need to make a good choice. You need to make a green choice. I think that's what it was called. Got to make a green choice. If you don't, you're, you're going to, don't make a, don't make a, uh, whatever they called it, but it would, they, they combined the zones of regulation as oh, oh, yeah. punitive along with this pushing to finish this thing without any recognition of this child was totally physically exhausted and then emotionally overwhelmed and it ended in a restraint okay and you said i, know, I can't even it, the, the fact that they're even saying the word cho i mean that's used so much in schools i'll make good choices right. when, and, and now i'm now i'm going tina bryson and dan siegel and the whole brain child and the upstairs and downstairs brain mm -hmm. choices is the upstairs brain right. sensory processing is the downstairs brain they're not able to make choices. Please stop saying make good choices. Go downstairs in their downstairs brain with them and meet them where they are. It will well, prevent see, the restraint. So you're getting me going, because here's what I'd say. Who's the one who's not making good choices? Who's the one that's in their cognitive brain that should be making better choices? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well who, who has a fully myelinated frontal cortex, you know? I mean, right, right. Yeah. Who has a fully developed brain? Right. We're making the bad choices because we're able to make choices. We're assuming right. it, it's like when they call kids manipulative. It, they're not manipulative. That's such yeah. a higher cognitive skill. Like, right. no, they're, they're downstairs yeah. brain. They, yeah. they can't do X, Y, or Z, but they are capable of this incredibly com complex manipulation. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. yeah. But, you know, and you, you kind of posed a rhetorical question about, you know, the, the number of restraints, seclusions that, that might be at, at, at part due to the adult escalating the situation. And, and I would say, you know, based on the, the individuals that I talked to and the experiences that I've had, that the majority of the instances... Yeah could have been at some point along the way avoided and, and hopefully Absolutely. proactively before they actually turn into crisis. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, I would say that the majority of restraints and seclusions that happen are, are not things that are happening because a true crisis has emerged. Right. Th these are things that happen because often a well-intentioned perhaps, but, but uninformed adult is not only failing to de-escalate, they're escalating the situation. They're putting right. demands on the child when the child is not at a state where they can meet the demands. Right. Yeah, we, we, we need to, to be able to, to step back um, and, and pick up on those cues. Yeah. And again, I agree with the well-intentioned adults here. You, I almost, you, you kind of wish you can 
go back and see what happened and kind of do the, the, the Monday morning quarterbacking as an education piece, because I agree the majority of them in my right. experiences, right. The, the, I don't want to say all, but yeah. darn near close totally could have been avoided. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and that said, as I was reminded a couple of weeks ago by a teacher, when, when I tried to be gentle in my words and she said, well, you know, something effective, there are some bad players out there. There are people out there that, that are very compliance based, uh, that look at, uh, you know, education as a control uh, mechanism. But I, again, I would say that that is clearly the minority. Most people, I think, want to, you know, want to do the right thing. But, you know, we have a lot of information out there that hasn't been helpful. You know, we, we, we have a lot of schools you know, that are using uh, ideas that are 30 years old. Yeah. And we're, we're really good at uh, throwing the newest initiative out there. And, and there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that we're throwing out there. And really what we're talking about is stepping back and relying on our relationships. Like we're talking about such a, a simplistic starting point of, you know, partner with the kids, um, parents, teachers, it, it doesn't matter. You need, student buy-in you need that trust and safety thank you for throwing up the model of child engagement um that you you need to to start there um and and just just to to speak to the slide that that you put up that if a child does get dysregulated um that if you don't feel safe in your classroom you can't be regulated and you have to be regulated in order to participate. That's what is the, the model of child engagement. That is the, the clinical model that I created that, that has become more universal because it makes sense that if a child gets dysregulated, back off and get to a point where they feel safe in their environment, they trust you and the environment around them. When you're there, then you can start addressing some of their sensory processing. Now you have a perfectly regulated kid who's available to learn. You can start going up the stairs to the upstairs brain, and now you can actually teach them. And then if they're having difficulty participating, well, then you ask them what's up. So the collaborative and proactive solutions model fits perfectly in for a child who's having difficulty participating. Um, if they need to move, you're going back to regulation. If they're getting completely dysregulated, they're not feeling safe in their environment. Mm -hmm. For parents, if you're yelling at your child or you're taking something away from them, they don't feel safe. They feel that you can wield your power at any moment. And that is a, not a relationship based on trust. They don't feel safe. You have to go back to that point. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's so much I'm evolution gonna... that needs to happen here in terms of it's not just about what's happening in schools, but even treating children like they're individuals with, with a will and, and, and right. uh, you know, their own feelings and senses and, 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 and you know, too often, you know, um, you know, and, and, and we've all, you know, we've all probably, you know, made our share of uh, mistakes and, and learned along the way, but th there's such a shift that needs to be made uh, in, in terms of respecting children uh, in so many of the things that we're, we're doing to kids in schools and, and even in homes um, rather than working with kids. And I, I mean, you know, I, I know we both are, are big fans of uh, Ross Green's work and, and collaborating with kids, but it really is amazing what happens when you develop relationships. I mean, you talk, talk about trust and safety and the core of trust and safety is a stable relationship, someone you can actually trust. And, you know, kids can't, can't learn if they don't feel safe. Um, yet you pile the expectations on and, and expect them to do well. So, I mean, that, that's a, a really critical point. I think that you bring up there is that, that need to, you know, uh, you, you can't do anything. Uh, we had uh, Jennifer Abinett who wrote an article for us at one point, uh, regulation before education. You know, it just kind of gets to that same point. You've, you've got to be regulated in order to learn. Right. So there was, there's uh, a couple of things that come to my mind. There's so much about uh, school is they, if you get the stuff from the, for, at the national level, it's all about teaching the kids, teaching the kids, getting them prepared to learn. To, and really, again, in my, my post retirement years where I've really learned is we got to stop thinking that they're going to learn from us feeding them information. And we got to listen more. We got to listen. And they have so much that they they already know if they're allowed to express it and bounce it off off someone that mm -hmm. it's listening patiently answering questions that come up asking questions we don't have to have this 
pile of information that we have to feed into kids, they are active learners directing the learning if we will just allow it. Yeah. All right, so that it's was my point. That <laughs> the, um, in giving, you know, giving kids ownership and getting, getting buy-in, it's amazing how they rise up to the challenge. Um, there, was, there was an infographic that I had posted about um, just how much I can't stand crisscross applesauce and 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 preschool <laughs> circle times and and preschool circle times have become this this major event every day. They're like forty five minutes long. They do the the weather, the calendar, the almanac, the horoscopes. The it's just it's incredible. Um, and it's interesting that when you, in terms of changing positions, like every ideally we would love for them to all just sit quietly in their cube chairs and just take in the information and raise their hand. And But if you give the kids some ownership, if you, you let them change positions and what's gonna make their body feel good, if you give them some say, they actually take that responsibility very seriously. Um, it's amazing how if you're brave enough to let go and share a little bit of power that mm. The kids take it. And, you know, some kids may take a little bit longer. And, and those are the kids you give a little bit more support to. But it's amazing how kids will rise up if you give them the opportunity and a little bit of responsibility. Yeah. And, and any person, I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I remember seeing that meme that you had about crisscross applesauce. Yeah. Well, that, that certainly doesn't sound very um, appealing to me. I can't be, imagine being put in that you know, that position, but we right. often put demands on kids that we wouldn't put on other adults. I mean, I think about things like that, the clip charts, would, would we do that in a workplace Would we have people clip up and clip down and shame them and humiliate them. Right. Um, you know, we've, we've got to shift that mindset from doing things to kids that, that we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do it to another individual. Some and, kids can't sit. Some adults can't sit in crisscross. Yeah. yeah. Um, Am I correct in saying that all three of us are sitting in chairs that move? That's right. And I, I've been moving. <laughs> I am sitting in a chair that moves. Oh, look at, we would all have our clips moved because we're not sitting still. And I'm fidgeting with my wedding ring right now. <laughs> so, I, you know, we're, we're, we're sensory beings and right. yes, we would, we're all not fitting into that, that this is how we sit and learn that, right, that right. Old full body listening mentality type thing. Right. Right, right. So um, real quickly here, if you don't mind, we have a lot of conversation that's happened in the chat since we started. Uh, <laughs> it's just been on fire. And uh, I, I just want to take a few minutes to go through a couple of the comments here. Sure, if you don't please. Mind. Okay. Uh, and, and and Beth, this was one that you mentioned earlier uh, from Jenna White that said, OT yes. saved my son. Love, love, love OT. And, <laughs> and I think we've heard a lot to uh, you know support that as well. Uh, we also happen to have Lori Desitels with us today. Um, and she is, uh, she's she been uh, adding a couple of comments here. Lori, if you're not aware, is the author of uh, Connections Over Compliance, uh, teaches a program in educational neuroscience uh, at Butler University. And, and I'm, I'm kind of struck by how much similarity there is between kind of the, the work that you're doing, the work that Lori does, kind of the brain breaks, understanding your brain. There's, there's some amazing uh, intersection there. Yes. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the slides. Um, you know, Greg, I don't know if you're comfortable sharing slides, but a couple of people have asked that that might be a possibility. So every slide that I use today, except for the definition of sensory processing, which you can Google, every slide is an infographic that's already on my Facebook page. Um, so, so if you go into the photo section, the sensory validation, the model of child engagement, and the, um, the eight senses, they're all at, at my Facebook page, uh, Greg Santucci, Occupational Therapist, so that you already have them. Yep. And, and if you're not following Greg's page, then make sure you are because there, there's <laughs> amazing information there. Uh, you know, we, we constantly are, are sharing things over in the Alliance side. Uh, Susan Jones here says the Nile of others experiences is so much of the work. Uh, appreciative of all you do and, and um, what we do. Uh, calling this out is imperative for our students everywhere. Right. And our kids. Yep, absolutely. Kids, absolutely. Kids, yep. Um. And a couple of people talking, my son was forced to listen to music he did not like uh, while in the room, uh, then got in trouble uh, trying to grab the assistant's laptop. Uh, you know, again, you know, you, you mentioned kind of those sensory things. And, um, you know, the, the amazing thing is that if, you know, I love the story about the father who came in and, and realized the problem as soon as he saw, you know, kind of heard the computer yeah. fans. Um, you know, there are so many things that just, you know, 
may not be the same experience that the individual, the educator has, and, and they just totally uh, disregard the feelings of the child. Right. And, and he was, he was unable to articulate that particular thing, but he was articulating it through his behavior. But if you just look at, oh, he's tantrum, he's melting down, he's avoiding, he's, you know, if you just go there, you're you're not going to get to the underlying problem. Um, it happens a lot. And, and I had people today that I was working with where when kids hit, um, that they focus so much on the hitting and we get so offended um, when a young kid hits. And the, the first question that I always ask is why? Like mm -hmm. what, wh what was going on? And it usually comes down to a communication issue where they weren't able to, to mm -hmm. come out and say what was actually bothering them. So, okay, well, we know hands are not for hitting, um, <laughs> but we have to validate what they're feeling, what their experience was, let them know that, okay, I'm going to help you solve this problem. Hands are not for hitting, but I'm going to help you be there. Um, but right away, as we focus on the hitting, the punishment comes in. And once again, the problem isn't solved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a comment here from Ashley, don't stop stimming. It's regulating can be a form of communication. Teach acceptance and appreciation of neurodivergent people. Yes. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> happy hands are happy hands. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we have here. And and Beth, if you want to take a question here, I'm just kind of scanning this to look for some more. We've got a lot of comments here. A lot of people really appreciate, um, you know, kind of the things that you're bringing up here. Um, yeah, you know, somebody talking I, about. Go ahead. I, I think about um, something you were saying. I, I remember in my early years of um, dating and maybe early even what well, was dating, I think, with my um, with my husband, he he was a biter. I mean, we're adults and <laughs> I got him a teething ring because it was just, I mean, he <laughs> and put it in the freezer. This is so obnoxious for me to tell, but it was just the way he played, you know? And there were times he, that it was, it, it was too, it was too hard. It wasn't playful for me. And I would uh -huh. just smack never doing it on purpose, but it was an automatic defense reaction, sure. not sure. intentional at all. Uh, and neither one of us were, I mean, we were happy together playing, you know? And, and so I think with kids, lots of times what they do is not an intentional to hurt someone. Sure. Well, if you're talking now, so now, now we're, we're, we're really going sensory because when you're talking about proprioception, there's a whole lot of proprioceptors in the jaw area. I mean, what, what do kids do when they're stressed? They're sucking their thumb. They're sucking on their shirt. Like they're chewing on something they want. There's a, we go right to the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, that is absolutely uh, a, a sensory grab, to a, a regulating strategy. So, and that's a <laughs> sign that if you see kids biting their nails, biting their pencils, biting their shirt, start seeing where they're at from a regulation standpoint. They're, they're, they're stressed. They're anxious. They're, they're telling you something with their bodies that when I see kids go to the mouth, boom, I go right back to trust and safety first. And, I, and I'm looking to see if they're anxious or if they're dysregulated and then getting them from a, a place of calm. So I loved your story. And then I just put it right back into the, the world of sensory. Like, yeah, hey, you know what? He went right to the mouth. <laughs> You know, one of the things that, that this um, this makes me think about is is that, you know, very often, um, you know, when I talk to a parent or a family or an individual uh, that, that has ended up being restrained, secluded, you know, suspelled, expended, corporal punishment, whatever it may be, um, you know, very often what I see is a kid that's not being appropriately accommodated. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really the intersection here is that, you know, the, the sensory clues that are there for people are often, you know, not only miss, but, 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 but actually thought to be problematic. So, right. you know, kids not having their needs met, you know, as a result, there's some kind of sensory, uh, you know, so how, how would you, how would you um, respond to that? There's a, it's funny when, cause when you started talking, I immediately went to when I was in the sensory room at the seclusion room and what it was like. Um, yes, there. So when they're expecting, when the demands outstrip the expectations, right. um, well, no, I said that wrong. When when their skill set, the expectations outstrip their skill set, 
that's what it is. That's usually when it, it all starts going bad. Um, you know, I've worked in, in, in several, I've worked in high income district, low income districts and, and all different, you know, different types of populations. Um, and, and it always comes down to your, your I agree with you that their, their needs are just not being met. Um, and you know, there's a lot we can control in the classroom and there's a lot that we, we can't control, um, in terms of what's going on at home and everything like that. Um, but I will say that if we can meet their needs in school and they can come in and, and be feeling safe in school, they're going to have a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I agree with you that their needs are, are not being met. The, um, the other thing when you started talking about the seclusion room and bringing it back to that is not only are there, there, the needs not being met, which kind of get them in there, right. um, but they're not learning anything while they're in there. Right. When, I was sitting, when I was sitting in there, I was, it was just, it was lonely. I was completely powerless. There was, there was nothing to do. There was, there was, you know, I, obviously I, I was, if I was the student who was put in the seclusion room, I became dysregulated to a point that I couldn't recover. And, and but sitting in there is not teaching me anything. It's just, I'm just, it's just breaking me or wearing me out to the point where I'm exhausted um, and then returning um, so I don't even know how the seclusion room no. is a solution. It's like right. how, how adults came to think that that was a solution other than just breaking or exhausting a kid to get back to compliance because there's no learning, no, no teachable moment, no regulation strategies happening in a seclusion room. I think people aren't thinking. I mean, that's the only thing I can come up to because you cannot rationalize you, if you think through what is this doing, you can't get to it doing any good. All of the research shows that seclusion is bad for everyone, mm-hmm. uh, not just the kid being secluded. Um, right. So <laughs> yeah. when we think about what do they think they're doing, they're not thinking. Uh, I mean, adults right. who are using seclusion are not looking at the literature. They're not self-reflecting. They're, they're doing something by road or something that, that they think they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah I was just to say, if we reference your, your uh, model of engagement here, uh, one of the things that you hear sometimes is that kids are put in seclusion rooms to regulate, that they need to calm down and regulate. But there is absolutely nothing regulating about being put no. into an empty room against your will and, and, and being put into a room in a state where your amygdala is on high alert, you're in a no. fight or flight mode. There's nothing about being in seclusion that gets you back to trust and safety. In fact, you know, the use of restraint and seclusion can absolutely, if only used once, can absolutely demolish trust and safety. Uh, right. My son remembers this day, the man that it restrained him in the fifth grade and, and has a visceral reaction if he sees him even out in public. Um, you know, so this is, you know, th- th- there's nothing therapeutic about it. No, and self-regulation skills need to be taught. Right. And it's funny, like we, we teach self-regulation skills, first of all, through the games of childhood. So musical chairs, red light, green light, um, that's a lot more fun than seclusion rooms. Like that's, that's where you learn to, you get, I mean, think of musical chairs. When was the last time you saw musical chairs in a kindergarten classroom where you're kind of, you get amped up cause there's three kids and two chairs. Right. And then you get to a place of calm and then same with red light, green light, you get amped up a little bit and then you freeze and you got to be in a state of calm or, um, sleeping, sleeping, all the children are sleeping. Like these, this is how self-regulation skills are taught. So we, we're teaching the kids about their body, what they're feeling. Um, and I'll go back to Mona on that, that yeah. to get to that point where they can learn them and be taught, they have to go to your, the slide you just had up that was about safety. So they have to get sure. the co-regulation and they may have to get it over right. and over and over again before they're even capable of learning the, the self-regulation. Yeah. And, and many of the kids Mona, that are Mona, having these. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. So Mona jumped up and down, and I completely agree with her that self-regulation has become such a buzzword. Yeah. But co-regulation is right. where we need to focus. That is the take-home message. That it is the and and for teachers, and I get it with teachers that that you know if there's a disruptive kid, they're being measured on pushing the group forward. 
So like, I, I understand the pressures that they're under and that they got to get the lesson in and that, that they're being measured from high stakes testing and, and, and all of that. But the most important part of their job is to co-regulate with their kids, uh, with their students, and for, to be that sense, that safe human being. Um, it's so vital. And I'll hear teachers push back and say, oh, yeah, I don't have time to, to co-regulate with, with 25 kids individually. And I, and I understand that. But I'll also, having worked in the schools for 20 years, and I still work in the schools now, um, to go in there and create a community where everybody's kind of working together, um, you you can create um, a, a classroom where the teacher is this this gigantic co-regulator with all of the minions in there. Um, it can happen. I've seen it done a lot, um, but we talk about self-reg, and it's the co-regulation is just yeah. And and the okay, thing ahead. about the teacher too, the kids are co-regulating each other uh, when you have a when kids have that understanding and when the environment is safe um right. so you don't have to yeah. be alone um well, yeah, but it's yeah. such a paradigm shift right yeah i was going to make the point that that you know many of our kids that, that are ending up in these situations are six seven eight you know years old and and the truth is that they don't even really have the ability to, to self-regulate at that point co-regulation is what's required i mean it, it's not even just a wish i mean it's you know not having the ability to do that they, re, they require that adult presence to help them uh regulate so i mean the expectations sometimes are totally out of line with right. uh the reality And it's 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 interesting because the <laughs> the um <laughs> this isn't covered in teacher education. Uh, I'm pretty okay. I'm pretty sure that they're not getting this in their education. But at the same time, I'm going under the assumption that it's for a lot of them. It's what brought them into the profession to begin with is to 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 have a group of kids that that you know you're you're the you're the 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 teacher you're their rock you're their their safe space. Um, so it's, it's there, it's there for us to take. It's always been there. Um, the initiatives and, and the pressures and the, the, the high stakes testing has all gotten in the way. Um, yeah. we just have to go back to basics. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, someone made a comment about standards, um, that a response to something was we, we have standards. Uh, and it's so interesting. I had a, uh, a communication with my brother who is, um, He's he calls himself a computer geek. I was going to call him a rocket scientist because he is a, an engineer and he used to work with rockets. But anyway, um, he was talking about how he figured out something, and the, and then the the work the bosses want him to write down step by step everything he did to get to that point. And he said, "I will not do that because it took thinking at each step. It took figuring out things, and and uh, it made me think about." Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it. It made me think about PBIS and, and Virginia's uh, code of conduct, which has, uh, well, it's more of the PBIS, which has, if the child does this, you decide first whether it's a classroom or a, to have a list of what you do instead of being free to feel it, to see it, to interact mm -hmm. authentically with the child. And I, I don't even want to use the word authentically. To, to react, interact with the child in a natural way, instead of feeling like you've got this set of stuff you have to do that make you get to a place you don't even want to be. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I want to hit a couple other questions here real quick. Um, sure. we, we have one from Ralph. He says, uh, do you have experience working with clients whose sensory needs are to move about almost continually, uh, they get stabilization from walking and rhythmic activity. That is a really interesting question. I'm actually going to spin it a little bit. Um, so what we would call, but potentially reading into to Ralph's question, uh, a sensory seeker of movement. Um, if I don't necessarily know if the particular child in question or in general, if they are a sensory seeker or if I put my polyvagal lens on, if they're mobilizing because they're stressed or anxious um, and may need to down regulate a bit. There are 
and and I almost um, would if if I were if I were to put this into a to a, a diagnosis per se, a, a kid who truly has ADHD, um, the the kids who are just constantly in motion and may be seen as a sensory seeker, sensory, but the movement is so dysregulating for them that they're never able to come down. Um, I find that the movement gets problematic. Um, so there's those kids. This is why I have to talk to an OT. Um, and then there are the kids who truly are seeking movement. And then it's our job to find out when they meet their threshold. And if you watch them, they meet their threshold. You're, you're able to see when they meet their threshold. Their, their affect changes, their body changes. Their, there's this, this calm that comes over them, um, almost like an, an empty cup in their head. And when they get the sensory input, um, when the cup overflows, that's when the learning happens. So when they meet their sensory threshold, you're able to transition them to, to more of a work thing. I'll give you a great example of something that happened in school with uh, an autistic child. And um, we had put a jumping thing in the classroom, uh, right in his classroom. It was fantastic, like a big giant trampoline. And he was having problems paying attention and sitting and doing his work. So we just let him jump. And he jumped for 23 minutes. And when he, uh, tw that was what he needed for his threshold. It was the first day we're like, let's just see where it goes. A lot of times we'll put limits to it. Five minutes, 20 jumps, but we don't know what we're saying. We just let the kid go 23 minutes. Um, and this is, again, he, he didn't have um, verbal, very limited uh, verbal language. Um, and, and he was autistic. After he jumped for 23 minutes, he just got off of it and sat down and he did table work for 20 minutes. And it was the longest work that he's ever done. And we just, we, we met his threshold and we go. And that kept happening. There were days where he only jumped for seven minutes, but then he worked for another 20. So for the sensory seekers, we need to know what their threshold is. But if you don't feel like the movement's actually working for the kid, I would look for other that answers, Ralph. Oops, Greg, it looks like you broke up on us a little. You there? Yeah, we froze, uh, but now we're back. Yeah, okay. Okay, now you're back. Okay. Huh. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, how much, you know, how much I'm, I'm I <laughs> uh, Just like a, a minor second towards the end, you were you you broke up a little bit before that, but it was, it was uh, we, we could hear what you okay. were saying, but just very minorly at the end there. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, you know what's, what's interesting to me, you know, I've got more questions for you lined up, but but I'm reflecting on my own experience, uh, you know, with my kids uh, going through school and, and reflecting about uh, the way that that schools uh, utilize or, or perhaps underutilize the OTs uh, oftentimes. It, it seems to me that you're you're much more apt to uh, have a behavior uh, behaviorist who's who's ready to uh, assess the situation <laughs> than an OT. And, and and how do we shift? How do we shift to? I mean, because you know, um, and again, you know, uh, you know the approach. Um, and, and and you know, I, I don't. Well, I mean, I'll say it for what it is. Uh, you know, I've had many conversations with a behaviorist who says, "Well, we don't care why something's happening. We only want to modify it." So uh, yeah, not to put what's you, going on in the head. That's right. So so not to put you in the hot seat, but I'm thinking about my own situation. And 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 many times the the OTs that we worked with over over the years. Um, certainly did not have kind of the insights and, and, and background that you're bringing to the table. I, I feel like my experience was were limited with how how comfortably to hold a pencil. And, and you know what you're bringing here is, is so much more to what needs to happen before we begin to to make any efforts uh, to do anything. We've got to understand the situation. I mean, it almost seems like the the OT assessment should happen long before a behavioral assessment, which seems to be kind of the standard approach. So anyway, that's a loaded question. It. That's it. Yeah. So okay, and and you're 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 with with only 15, 20 minutes left. You're you're, you're dropping behaviorism. In. I'm like okay, I'll take right. the bait a little bit. Um, <laughs> so here's here's how I will diplomatically say this: How do you address behavior if you don't have knowledge about the brain? 
when all the brain comes from the behavior. So in the training, in, in that frame of reference, there is no training in neuro. In occupational therapy training, we have training in neuro and anatomy and physiology, and we essentially have minors in psychology. We Our foundation is mental health. In schools, we get pigeonholed. We're handwriting therapists and then right. we're sensory diets or sensory strategies um, because schools like to just pigeonhole us. But mm -hmm. I would submit to you, and, and this is provocative and I'm fine with that, is yes, an, an occupational therapist is a better analyst of behavior than people who call themselves behavior analysts because we're just bringing to the table that neuro. So with all of this polyvagal Mm -hmm. um, information that, that is, is now coming to the, to the forefront and thank goodness that it is the OTs are sitting here going, yep. Yep. Cause we were learning about the vagus nerve and everything in OT school and, and sensory integration, which now everyone's talking about sensory processing. Well, that has withstood the test of time too. Now we just are fortunate enough to have a generation of uh, autistic adults who are saying, Yes, this is my experience. This is what's bad. This is what didn't work. And yes, sensory, sensory, sensory. So this is a shout out to OTs. Let's go. Like, like we're, we're not, this is part of our training. This is in our practice act, talking about emotional regulation. You know, when I was sitting and I had to, and it was both horrific and fascinating to actually dissect a human brain in my OT training and to learn how the brain works and everything, we're still talking about that. So I completely agree with what you said that you should pull an OT in because we have a, just a, a broader range of what is actually potentially causing the behavior, not just the antecedent right before a behavior happened. Right. And I, I think, well, first of all, I want to say that you, one of my questions that we wrote down was, um, <laughs> Did you get much training on this? And in, in, in your training, my training was back in the early '70s, and uh -huh. we didn't get the we didn't get the stuff that they discovered in the last thirty years, because I'm really old. Um, but I I <laughs> I think that you I'm I'm so glad that's what OTs are getting. I hope PTs are too. But where what strikes me is that um, we are not affording the same training to teachers who are the frontline people who need to. And it's not that I'm, I'm going to make it sound like it's simplified, but it's, it's not that it's not that hard to learn. We're teaching kids that we're to learn. It's a different paradigm. It's not certainly the neuro, the actual details of it and the how everything, you know, the, the chemicals and the, uh, the neurons and the interface, all that is difficult, but the actual what impacts what and how, that is something every one of us working in a human services field, going, I'm on the sure. pulpit again, in the human services field should have. Otherwise, we are making, it, it's doing what I used to say about performance reviews where you put numbers and that somebody did this most of the time, this some of the time. And I thought, nobody's watching me. How can they decide what I'm doing most of the time? You put a number to it and it looks objective. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing with behavioral analysis. We do, it, it looks objective. We make it simple. We make it, you know, th this pattern you do, sure. whereas the, it's messy. It's messy right. to think, but it gets you where you need to go. You find right. the answer. Yeah. And, and I think that the key part is, is that, you know, that background and understanding the brain is so critical. You know, I don't know, I don't know, frankly, how you can understand how the brain works and do some of the things that are often done in reaction to behavior. And, and you know, I would just go back to, to somebody like Ross Green and say, you know, what happens is the focus is on the behavior. The focus yeah. is on the fever, not the underlying cause. And, and again, I mean, I'll, I'll underscore this, but I, I mean, I really do think it is, you know, is I've been talking to you today, like more lights are going on and I'm like, why on earth would you do a behavior analysis without first having an OT in to really kind of look for, uh, you know, one, to understand what's happening, but two, to, to kind of look for the places that they might be happening. And I think one of our commenters here said, uh, uh, you know, we OTs are so misunderstood. Uh, we need to seek out opportunities to show uh, how our skills can support students. But it, it really does seem like the model- She has wings. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes, OTs have wings. <laughs> I love it. 
maybe we, uh, somehow we can use that to to get them uh, earlier in the process. But I mean, it really does. It, it seems like you know the the process. Well, I'm not sure that all pieces that currently happen in the process should be happening. But mm -hmm. regardless of that, and I'll just leave that there. But you know, uh, you know, it seems like uh, much earlier that that the work that you're describing is something that's critical to help understand and support kids' needs. And, and to, to Beth's point about the, the data and trying to, to make it objective, um, you know, the data that we're taking, uh, like humans decide what we're taking data on. Um, so whatever your training is, that's what you're taking the data on. So we're taking a lot of bad data um, right. because we're not we're not getting to the crux of the issue. Um, and OTs are, are pretty terrible at, at data collection. I mean, uh, kudos to the behaviorists for they are the most intense data collectors. I just submit that it, it's not necessarily good data. I've seen volumes and volumes of data that show that the kid has mastered everything when in fact he's mastered nothing. Right. Um, so it has to be good data. And there's a big focus in the literature on data-driven decision-making. Mm -hmm. And while that is important and measuring our outcomes is important, I would submit to you that a relationship driven decision making model needs to be first so that we can then get good data and prove our effectiveness and I, there's such pushback from that data driven decision making dddm ddm and no trust and safety first and yes. then you're going to know exactly where you stand and not only is your your data going to be better your outcomes are going to be bigger and they're going to be faster so if you mm -hmm. start slow, you will get to your end point faster. And I mean, I don't want to put a number on it, but 100% of the time it works. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, and again, if, if you're running around with your clipboard, you're not making that relationship. And, I, yeah. and again, I can tell you a personal story. My, my son, who had a, a very, um, you know, active data collector as a teacher, uh, <laughs> you know, was, was aware of the data collection process and, and essentially asked the question one day, do you ever do you ever do you ever write down anything I do well? Do you ever write down anything I do good? I think he said, but you know, I mean, he became very, very aware of it. So, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, compassion and, uh, you know, um, relationships are, are so much more important than kind of the compliance and the numbers. It's how do we build relationships with people? Because as you meant, you, you know, that the meme you put up recently about, you know, uh, what was it about kids and, uh, you know, behavior plans that, you know, if you, if you feel safe and, yeah. um, you know, um, you, you feel supported and I'm not going to yeah. get it all right, but um, you don't need necessarily right. that. And if you do, you know, if you don't, it doesn't matter what your behavior plan says. If you, you don't right. feel secure, you don't feel supported, you don't right. like your teacher, uh, you know, you're not going to do well. Um, so certainly we're seeing other people here, um, you know, maybe another OT here, uh, you know, saying that, uh, you know, that they're not respected or taken seriously um, or mental health not being taken seriously in schools. Um Truth. You know, so certainly you it seems know, like there's an issue. And and what we have, um, what I hope we all can influence is um, what taken seriously means, because there's the big uh, SEL, the social emotional learning, that is the big buzzword, and everyone's doing it. But there, it is being. Uh, weaponized. I heard it uh, claimed as being weaponized because it becomes something. If you're so, this, it's based on so much of social emotional learning is based on the white European culture. And then if you're not doing the the stuff the same way as the standards, which were based on this, there's just so many so many things when we think about how we implement these great ideas that can get the the emphasis on standardization which used to be a big buzzword for me i liked you know i like the idea that you knew what to expect but it, it warps things um anyway yeah and i have to i'm gonna call ot's out a little bit here because what what i found and and i've been traveling the country for for a while now and i've met a ton of ot's and, and there's a there's a theme there's a couple of problems when you're a contracted therapist and you're not an employee, it's a money issue. And it, it's, a, it's a number of hours. And, and that's one of the things that can get in the way of, of OTs actually getting in the door. Um, so there's definitely um, an economic reason as to why OTs don't get, get legs. Um, but I have met many OTs that have just 
fallen into the behavioral trap that is so prevalent in school. And they don't want to ruffle feathers with their, their colleagues and, and they want to follow through with the other, the other things that are already in place. Um, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay to not take the, the tackle box of chips and M&Ms with you to your OT session to give little food rewards. Like it's okay to say that I don't need that. I use this to, to get his body ready and to, to not just comply with what's what's being done, to, to not only push back, and you may ruffle feathers a little bit, but to say what worked for you and to advocate for more brain-based approaches as opposed to behavior-based approaches. And and I don't know, it, it, OTs need to, to step up a little bit and, and do a little bit of preaching and stand up for themselves and their knowledge base, which is so broad. Um, and, and so, you know, for me, when I travel around, one of the things that I want to do is inspire OTs to start speaking up. How do we, you know, you know, cause as you say that, I understand where you're coming from and, and probably agree with you that, that, you know, I mean, you, people get beaten down by systems. Systems are difficult mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, schools and, and, and the like can be very bureaucratic, uh, very, um, you know, kind of uh, focused and driven in, in one direction and one direction only. Um, what can we do to empower people to do that? I mean, you know, I think about it and, and you know, um, as we think about how to influence changes in schools, you know, it can happen at a lot of different levels, but it seems like OTs could potentially be in a position to really impact a lot of positive change. So is there a way as a community, are there organizations, are there other ways to support people? Be, you know, you, you have a, uh, you know, I think a, a large audience and following now and uh, a lot of respect for, for what you're doing. But, you know, again, you know, imagine yourself as an OT surrounded by uh, people that see the world differently. Um, how do we support people in those roles? It, it, do you have any thoughts on, on how to do that? So my best success in the school, so I'm going to take it really small. I'm going to go into a school building first, um, that, and then I'm going to talk about professional development in general. So mm -hmm. my best success in the schools are finding that teacher who gets it. Um, having that success story, having, you know, finding a teacher that just connects with the kids and you coming in and bringing in your OT strategies and just watching it work. And it happens all the time and not being quiet with that success, mm -hmm. because then you take that to a principal or to another teacher and you build it from there and you build an army based on success. That's really what I did with, with brain breaks is I gave, something, I, I gave something simple to them that they could easily access and then we just blew it up and I got buy-in. So it's that positive message in the trenches that really helps. There's a lot of sharing students. I know this works with him, this works. And then the OT should be offering to do a professional development course. Put yourself out there. Talk about the information that we talked about here. Eight senses instead of five and expand it out from there. And then it just keeps growing because then you can go district wide. And, and so I always start at the ground level, you know, going big is really hard because there's so many cooks in the kitchen in the school. My best success yeah. is with the teacher. Yeah, you, you know, one of the things that that makes me think, and I, I saw Michelle put a comment in here about, you know, kind of the difficulty of, of trying to start kind of bottom up. Um, but, you know, one of the things that crossed my mind as you were talking about that, uh, and again, I, whenever I ask a question about what what can we do, uh, I try to put myself in that as well and think like, yeah. you know, what what could we do? Um, and, you know, one of the things I think that would be really helpful, I don't think enough parents even know the value and benefit that an OT can offer or even the background that an OT can offer. Yeah. Uh, their exposure comes when somebody says, oh, we're going to bring an OT to help with X. And it's a very limited thing. But what what if we could better educate parents, individuals, uh, families, teachers uh, to the value and training and background, just like we're doing today? I mean, sure. this to me is part of that. But I, I would love to, to think with you how we might be able to do that on a, on a greater level. Maybe it's getting in other really amazing OTs and, and, and you know, talking to, uh, you know, because, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if a parent's there suggesting too that, oh, gee, you know, I, I heard that OTs can be really helpful here. Would this be appropriate to have, you know? So there, there might be an option to, to get at it from the other direction as well. Uh, I absolutely love that. And and the, the pushback 
from the schools is is the the lack of knowledge of what OT right. is. Now, right. Our right. OTs don't do that. It's the fine motor. It's the fine right. motor. Um, and yeah. let me ask you, Greg. Do you do you, um, and I think about this when I think about PTs, and it's not. I don't think it's just when I went to school all those many years ago. There's so much you learn in school that you don't get abroad. You kind of have to choose where you're going to focus. So do all OT, I know that all OTs are not like you. Right. I'm just going to say that because you've done extra learning. Right. You you have sought out the stuff. So if you um, say find an OT, what are the chances that the OT is going to be able to do what we're talking about doing? So, yeah. So I'll tell you my journey. Um, I got really frustrated with the world of OT um, a while back. So I, I went out of the OT literature because I felt like we were just spinning our wheels with sensory, sensory, sensory. So mm -hmm. I went out and that's when I started getting into the parent literature, um, a little bit more into to neuroscience. And when I found it, I said, oh my God, and I went right back to OT. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting journey to, to be fed up with the, the literature um, bucket that we have in OT and to be like, we know this. So yes, there's the extra learning is something that I've done on my own, but I'm mm -hmm. right back to my roots and I'm right back to what I learned in OT school with the neuro. Um, so to, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. I think that it, and I think we're seeing lots of comments about administration stifling uh, the use of OT. So, and when I think about uh, bottom up versus top down. I, I think it has to be both um, because I do think different schools, some are open if you get that teacher and, and parent together. And I heard what Michelle said. I heard what she said because I read it. Somehow that hearing came from the vision. That was, anyway. that was totally a sensory thing. You just, <laughs> you just brought it all together. <laughs> the, the, um, it's, it's, parents are absolutely exhausted. And I was one of those exhausted parents. It is just to get through the day is difficult, yeah. um, depending on, on your kids. And I had two that were um, had their own challenges. They, it has to be uh, in, in each parent should not have to fight this battle anew. We have got, I agree with whoever said about legislative, and it's even more than legislative. It's, it's more of what are we doing from the training institutes at the um, education level, at the federal level. Somehow we have to pull all of those together so it's not so darn hard at the individual basis. And we have to, we have to get the payers the payers on board. I mean, yeah. it is extremely frustrating where I can have somebody go into a house for 20 hours a week and work on activities of daily living, dressing, showering, all sorts of grooming, where we have specific training in that as OTs. And they do not have any training in that. So they'll get 20 hours because of a, a bucket of old single study research. Um, mm -hmm. And yet occupational therapists maybe will get one hour a week. Uh, with, even though we have the specific training on that, it drives me nuts. So the, you know, follow the money uh, is, a, is a huge problem with this. Yes. And it's interesting when we think about what makes changes because there's a literature out there um, you know what I'm talking about, the military, the TRICARE yeah. data. TRICARE, of course, it says, yeah. it says it's not working, but we still do it. <clears throat> and I think about in a private uh, company, you probably would have pulled that research a long time ago if you got the results that the TRICARE got. Um, but yeah, I think it's so multifaceted um, yeah. how we're yeah. going to need to approach this. But what I love is the number of people who are involved and interested and as we continue talking about it and talking with each other and with our own um, spheres of influence, it's it's going to expand, and we have to keep figuring out how to expand more. So, um, yeah, Beth, I think that's a, a fantastic point, and um, you know, I, I want to get a little practical here. Is we've actually kind of we're, we're kind of hitting our time limit, but but that is uh, Greg to ask you, you know. Um, for, you know, we've got a, a broad audience here. We have people that are working in schools. We have parents. We have uh, self-advocates, autistic self-advocates, all sorts of people that are part of our, our audience. Um, and 
Are there places that you recommend people go to look for uh, an o OT that might be helpful? Or is there criteria that you have? I know there are groups like the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective and yep. others that, that are putting together kind of these standards of practices and things like that that look really promising. But do you have certain places that you refer people to? So that is a good reference. And I also um, go to the Star Center um, in Colorado. Uh, they have great resources on their great research, uh, and I believe there is a directory as well. Um, but what I would say to to parents is interview the therapist. Just ask them some questions. What are their thoughts about behavior? What have you read? What do you? I ask that when I'm interviewing um, therapists that I'm going to take on. Is you know how do you? What are you reading to keep yourself up in the field? Um, and if You'll you'll find the one, and and you have every right to interview a therapist and make sure that they're aligned with wh what you're trying to do at home. So yes, the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective, yes, the Star Center in Colorado, and yes, interview your therapists. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, uh, you know, I would say, and maybe I'm wrong here. I'm, I'm curious on your your take on it, but uh, I would say there's an important part of about uh, following your feelings as well, because I've heard. Uh, a lot of professionals that can talk a really good game about things that are very wrong. <laughs> so, you know, interviewing is great, but you you also have to to gut check things as well mm -hmm. and, and make sure that, you know, they're aligned with your, you know, if you have, you know, principles and ideas that you think are really important uh, or an approach to, you know, how you work with your child, you know, follow your gut. Um, <laughs> I just said that to somebody the other day in, in a private message back and forth. Yeah. I, I She was asking me all these questions and I said, I am going to completely bow out and mother's gut is going to prevail here because of everything that we all know, that okay. is still the number one thing that you should go with. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And, and I'll say one of the things where I have learned a tremendous amount is from uh, individuals themselves, from the autistic um, self-advocates from the not an autism mom who is interviewing sure. people, I think every week. Um, and uh, her name just skipped my mind. She lives here in, in Virginia. Why did I forget that? But anyway. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I know it as well as anything, but it's gone. Um, it, it'll be back in three minutes when we're done. Uh, uh -huh. But but these group, Neuroclastic, ASUN, uh, Ask an Autistic. Um, and also, I learned a lot from um, the parent. Um, we were talking earlier about Lori Petro. Um, I took her um teach with love she has I've, I've taken a couple of her courses and in, in her written thing that's for free um that there's some of what we have been hung up on is this trying to make everybody the same and alike and to get rid of characteristics that have have served us the um the, the ones that are so obvious mostly um, have been with autistic kids with the flapping or the, the various things, but all of us have some kind of uh, things that we do to regulate ourselves. And, and the issue is not that they're doing it, it's that the rest of us are so intolerant of uh, differences. So I, I'm hoping that as we learn as a society to appreciate um, differences rather than trying to um, program them out, mm -hmm. we will see less of the issues. Yeah, I, and I, I said it before, we are so lucky to have a, a generation of autistic individuals who are coming out and just teaching us. I mean, that is the, the best learning that, that we can get from all the articles mm -hmm. and textbooks and everything is the people who experienced it. And, and again, validating their experiences as real. Um, you know, our our opinion of that experience is irrelevant. What they what they experienced is so important. We need to validate that, take it as truth, and run with it. Um, so mm -hmm. we're so fortunate to have them. Yeah, yeah, and I think this is where it gets important to understand what people's goals are when when they're working with people. Uh, and and you know, you hit it on the the head, Beth. I mean, some people, you know, some 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 approaches, the goal is to make people more, you know, to, to make people all the same, to make people yeah. uh, less autistic or to, you know, and, and if those are the goals, then you, you probably need to be heading in a different direction. You need to be heading a direction that's supporting and trying to help and, you know, whatnot, not just, uh, you know, um, bend people into compliance, you know. So on, on that note, we have run longer than I promised you that we would go, uh, but this has been a, a really amazing uh, conversation. Okay. <laughs> it goes by quick, right? It's been an amazing conversation, and and I'd love to to talk yeah, to you really. more often about 
you know, how can we raise more awareness about the uh, the amazing work that that uh, you know OTs can do and the contribution that they can make, and and you know, how can we begin to see a shift in some of that 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 people are thinking you know, before they think about behavior, before they think about you know the the symptom that they're thinking about the the underlying causes they're thinking about the brain because this is a shift. This is the shift we need to make, you know, with with teachers, with with all sorts of folks. So I'd love to talk to you more about that. But really, really appreciate you um, joining us today. It looks like we've had a fantastic audience throughout this event. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, people will. And, and I, I want to encourage you, you know, if you've enjoyed this event, share it. We have it on Facebook. We have it on YouTube. It's available as an audio podcast. You know, share it. If you're uh, a parent, share it with your school and your teachers. If you're a teacher, you know, share it with other teachers, share it with parents. Uh, if you're an OT, share it with the, the administration, yes. um, you know, and there's some great resources out there. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Do you have any final words before we uh, let you go? No. Th well, I can tell you that it was an amazing sensory experience. I'm actually running hot because of all of the topics. So, so I, <laughs> um, co-regulation is the most important thing. So mother's gut and co-regulation are the two biggest take home messages with all of this. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, it was absolutely fascinating. The comment section over here on my right is amazing. And uh, thank you for all of the work that you do and please don't stop. Thank you so much. And we'll <laughs> continue you. to work together. All right. And Beth, I want to thank you as well. And, uh, uh, we will see you again very soon on one of our upcoming programs. And with that, uh, I just want to mention real quickly here um, our next program. We actually have a special event coming up. We usually do these every every two weeks on Thursday. Uh, but we have a opportunity here to do a really fun and special event. We're going to be working with Dr. Lori Desitels, who has been a guest here a number of times, the author of Connections Over Compliance. Uh, she, of course, teaches that program in Applied Educational Neuroscience. She also works in schools. And if you joined us a couple of weeks ago, you might have seen an interview we did with a teacher, Lori Kirkland, talking about her experience applying neuroscience in the classroom. Really fascinating and fun interview, although I think it was the one I was having technical issues on. The, the internet was not working well, but it was a great interview. Um, Lori had an, well, Lori doesn't tell us had an amazing idea. Wouldn't it be great to bring on some of the teachers and administrators and students to talk about applied educational neuroscience in the classroom? So we're doing that next week on Tuesday. Tuesday at 11, uh, the 11th at one o'clock. That should be a lot of fun. So I would encourage you to join us for that. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is, you know, you're a really important part of this community and really appreciate you being here today. So thank you so much. And we will see you again next time.